Hello, uh, thank you for coming to uh, this panel about breaking into comics. Uh, I think probably the best bet is that we just introduce ourselves, talk a little bit about our respective uh, routes into the business and how we've stayed in the business, which is the real miracle of it. And um, then we'll ask you, know, ask you for any questions. So, Liam, do you want to start us off? Just introduce yourself. Um, I, I'm, yeah, I'm Liam Shalou. Um, I'm a colorist and graphic designer, and um, mainly the, the, what done work on the Transformer series for IDW. Um, DVD covers for Spider-Man, a bit of Doctor Who, G.I. Joe Godzilla, and um, video game stuff for PlayStation. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Lee, uh, Lee Townsend. Um, I, I started off as uh, money as an inker for uh, Marvel UK uh, on Spider-Man, um, X-Men, and Avengers, and later on uh, on Judge Dredd, and then eventually some work for DC as well. Uh, my name's Simon Furman. I'm a writer for comic books, TV animation, and I'm largely known for my work on Transformers since, I don't know, 1985 to now. So, uh, but I have worked on other things as well. Um, uh, you know, it, it's a weird thing breaking into comics because certainly for me, it's all changed since I broke into comics. Back in the day, pre-internet, pre-websites, pre, -websites, pre uh, deviant arts and all these sort of communities where you could show what you could do, you were largely reliant on knowing somebody in the business or working in another capacity within the comics industry. And I was lucky enough to work for a large publishing company in the UK called IPC Magazines, who published the likes of 2000 AD and Battle and Eagle and many of these comics that I'd grown up reading as a kid. So it was, it was great for me to be able to work in and around these comics and, and realize that people actually had jobs in comics and you know they had careers in comics. And it was a real eye-opener to me. And when the opportunity presented itself to go and work on one of these comics at IPC, which was a junior horror comic called Scream, I jumped at the chance and just thought, well, yeah, this is definitely what I want to be doing. Um, and actually, Scream didn't last that long, but I got my break uh, doing some script writing because we were always behind on deadlines and we needed scripts quickly, so I had to jump in and do some emergency script writing so we didn't miss our deadlines. And that really got me used to it. I used to go up to the 2000, 2000 AD office. And then from there, I just went from IPC to Marvel UK to Marvel US to many other comic companies. So it, I, I, it was a lucky route in for me, I guess. Yeah, mine was, um, I got my kind of, um, basically at Marvel UK, we're looking for artists um, at a convention in London. And I showed my portfolio, so I think it was uh, probably Paul Neary. Paul Neary at the time. Um, took me quite a long time. It took me about six or seven years to get, actually get my first comic work. Um, I just basically was quite persistent and determined, so I just kept going back kind of year after year. For me personally, you know, like, I suppose like everyone else here, you know, we like, love comics so much, you kind of want to stay in that field and carry on doing that, but it's not always, uh, not always possible. <laughs> so... I kind of uh, do storyboarding, uh, advertising work, um, but I have actually got some stuff hopefully coming up with DC in the next couple of months. So, uh, so yeah, that's it really. I just um, always prefer comics as a, you know, rather than the other kind type of art really. So I was just, just pretty determined and uh, yeah, just kept just kept going that way really. So, um, my story is really boring in comparison. I I was at university and basically for fun, just entered the competition I saw online and got second place against a professional. And so I was like, that's quite fun. I'll um, keep doing that. And I sent in it one day, I, was, I, I kind of read up what, what is a portfolio because I had no idea. And it was like, you need five, like five pages minimum for a portfolio. So I spent a weekend and went, I'm going to do five pages. 
and on the Monday I sent it out and got two emails back, one from Dark Horse for a tryout, and the second one was from IDW offering me a job. <laughs> and I kind of broke into comics that way. I was literally like, my, so the first time I sent something out, I got offered Transformers, and turns out I could do it pretty fast, and they kept going to me, we need a book done in like so-and-so days, can you help out on a book? I jump in, jump in. And I kept out of that for a couple of years and then ended up in the games industry as well. Same sort of thing. They were looking for someone for two weeks to do a job. And I went, sort of, I'll do it. And um, I ended up at PlayStation for five years as one doing house artists. <laughs> as I said, much, much more boring than everyone else's story. Uh, that's a good story. Uh, <laughs> took no effort. That's great. <laughs> you know, but a lot of creators you know, did get their break, as Lee was saying, by going to comic conventions like this, especially when you've got Marvel or DC or 2000 AD or Marvel UK in attendance. And often they would have portfolio reviews. Um, 2000 AD at the London conventions often have a, a thing they call the pitch fest, don't they, where people get a chance, because it's difficult being a writer and going to a convention go, yes, you can draw, you can colour, mm. and you know that within a, in about 30 seconds. But with writing, it's different, difficult. So with the 2000 AD idea was that there's literally, you have a 30-second slot to, or whatever it is, to sort of pitch your idea for a short future shock or one of the other stories. And it's a really good idea because it puts you under the pressure to do that thing everybody wants you to do, which is to buttonhole your story idea into one or two sentences at most. You know, get to the real grist of your, 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 your high concept, if you like, in as short a time as possible and really sell people on the idea. So, you know, conventions are a really, really good way of, of meeting people in the business, not just the editors, other writers, artists, mm. You know, the social side of the comics business has always been a big part of breaking into the industry. We organize a monthly get-together of freelancers just to get people together, to get people talking about what they're doing and maybe open doors and maybe say, look, I know somebody who's looking for an inker, or a letter, or a colorist. So, you know, the social side is very important when it comes to breaking in. But of course, there are other ways as well. You know, and you know, the other thing I suppose is once you're in the industry, as I'm sure we all know, staying in it can be as big a challenge as breaking in. You know, the industry is continually changing. You know, largely as well, the industry more and more is driven by a younger influx of creators. You know, the editors seem to want younger, newer, hotter artists, writers. So staying in often means finding your own little niche of, of you know, talent, if you like, or diversifying into other things like games, as Liam was saying, or I've moved into TV animation, scripting, and computer games myself. So, you know, it, it does mean that you've it's difficult to stay still in this industry. If you're not careful, you can get rolled over by the progress of the business. So you have to be endlessly adaptable, endlessly keep doing what you did to break in, which is network, get to know other creators, keep on the, the, you know, the sites like DeviantArt and the forums where you can keep relevant in a way and you know what's going on and you can look at other companies that are coming up. You know, it, in a way it's great now because you have got this way of producing your own comics quite cheaply. You can get together as writers, artists, colorists, mm. just creators and produce work that is, exists in the digital realm or you can literally print your own comics quite cheaply. So, you know, there are good ways now to put something physical in the hands of editors or, you know, send them a website link or your online portfolio. So more and more, I think the digital age has really helped yeah. break down some of those barriers. Yeah, I think what you're saying, like, 
well, um, back when I first started breaking in, like everyone's mind was on Marvel DC. That's where you kind of went. And um, with digital comics, like web comics, web animation, or even small press comics you get at conventions, people realizing that you, to be successful in the comic industry isn't being on the Avengers or being on Batman. Being successful in the comic industry can be, you know, you start a web comic that you produce once a, once a week or once a day from home, and you end up selling your own books. And I've seen so many people just, they actually make a living just creating their own stuff, because we think about when all these big Marvel DC characters, these are eventually like the ideas of someone, and that's their character. Every, everyone since then is working on their character. Mm. So the big thing nowadays is creating something brand new, like like Stan Lee and Jack Kirby did, and yeah. Bob Kane did, and kind of going, you know, this story doesn't tell the story I want to tell, or you want to tell something that's personal to you, be it like a, your personal journey, or your political stance, or just what, what makes you laugh. And it's kind of, so now, like before, it was like, you had this set goal, Avengers, X-Men, Batman, Superman, Justice League. Now it's, you know, can I pay my rent making and, and having some spending money each month, making my own stuff, drawing what I want to draw, writing what I want to write, not having to get told what to do, do it in your own free time, basically. And, I mean, that's a dream. Right? Like, and you can do it nowadays with the internet because you, you create not just a national or regional audience, but a global audience. You can, uh, as things with, especially like Comixology, you can create a comic in your bedroom, put it on Comixology, someone in Japan can be reading it. Right? You, can have re you can have a readership all around the world and you don't have a boss. Right? <laughs> and you, you look at a lot of the creators now, especially the writers, they broke in by doing their own thing first. You know, Brian Michael Bendis now is writing just about every Marvel yeah, comic, yeah. you think, but he broke in by producing these pulpy cr crime noirs like Jinx and Torso and then Powers and then once he got noticed that was it, the majors just moved in and snapped him up and it's the same with Kieran Gillen, the writer on Iron Man and Journey into Mystery and many others now he and Jamie McKelvey broke in doing this quite offbeat comic called Phonogram which was very very their own personal you know, like music history really turned into a, a strange comic book. But it got, it got them noticed. It was different. It grabbed people. It got some, you know, press and web, in, yeah. you know, interest. And then that's how they broke in, really. So, you know, this idea of doing your own comics, of, of doing your own thing first, once you get into Marvel and DC, they push you into slight channels and they want their comics a certain way in a certain feel. You know, you may be able to do it a little bit differently, but largely you're, you're in the Marvel style or you're in the DC style. But to make a splash initially, you've really got to do something that grabs the attention that people haven't seen before or is quite, you know, out there. And don't be scared of doing that if you're looking to produce your comics push the boundaries, go places where there aren't standard comic book. You know, I've been up and down the artist alley here looking at some of the comic books and they've got that lovely European flavour that, mm. you know, is quite different to American comic book storytelling. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, that's the way to get noticed nowadays. It's to do something non-standard. I think even like, um, just with readership, Marvel DC Comics, I think, so... If you sell something like 100,000 copies a month, that's a number one seller. But you look at things like Asterix, I think their last print run was 5 million copies. European comics, everyone again thinks Marvel DC, European comics has its own personal niche and it's so, it's much bigger really than American comics. It's, it's more popular, it's long, more long lasting. But not even that, just when you look at all these comics, with your own stuff, like now with the technology available nowadays, comics isn't always the end result of where you can go. I mean, Mark Millard just sold his, um, his company for creating comics to Netflix. Like, you can, comics now translates into video games, into TV shows, into films. Like, you can create a character, I mean, Ghost World, Men in Black, Ninja Turtle. I mean, Ninja, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles started off as two guys having a joke mm. and turned in, you know, basically made a multi-millionaire. Just, they were having some fun publishing a comic for, that I think they always said their first issue they just wanted to break even on 
and then they were the, sort of the first sort of people to realise, you know, license it out, get a TV show, get a, get a film, and but all comics can be like that because there's such a demand and a thirst for comic books all around the world, and so you look at it and go, can this be a good comic? If it, and in essence, if it's a good story, it can be a good comic, but it can also be a good film, a good TV show, yeah, or a good toy line if you're lucky. Yeah. I mean, certainly the way forward, you know, even an old dog can learn new tricks. You know, it's taken me a while, but finally we've started, you know, the, down the creator-owned route. Mm. Because really, you can only go so far doing comics for one of the main companies. Mm. And you own nothing in the end. It's very difficult to, you know, have anything that will support you later or you can license out. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, creator-owned is a really good way to go for so many reasons. Yeah. And then, by all means go and make a name for yourself at Marvel, DC, or one of the bigger companies, even one of the bigger European companies. Yeah. But it's good to have your own intellectual property as well, because that's ultimately the only really way to make an enduring living in this business. Yeah. And if you're lucky, you create The Walking Dead. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, again, Walking Dead is a fine example of what started as a, a, you know, a comic that they, you know, that they dug in to their own resources. You know, Image Comics, everyone thinks, you know, Image Comics pays for these things. No, you put, you put your own blood, sweat and tears into these Image yeah. Comics and they help you get it printed. With that, that's their financial contribution. Yeah, you, you, have to pay, you actually have to pay Image Comics to get your comic published. Yeah. Like, but yeah, yeah. No, so, you know, but they, they dug in, you know, obviously did a lot of work for free, which is what you end up yeah. doing. Mm. But here they are, you know, Charlie Adlard and um, oh God, Tony Moore. Thank you. Yes, yeah. uh, you know they're, you know, they they've made a huge amount of, of merchandise. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they they could live on Walking Dead for the rest of their lives. Yeah. So, you know, creator own so important now. Mm. Uh, do we want to throw it open for questions? Does anybody have any burning questions? Do we have a microphone uh, running around? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hello. Uh, hi. So, um, uh, basically, if the first question is uh, for Liam. Yeah. Okay. Colorist. Yeah. I I struggle with color, and I was wondering whether it's something you are naturally good at, or it's something you can learn. Inclined to have certain set of skills that lend them towards um, different abilities, like especially in art. So you could um, look at colouring, you could have naturally good colour theory, and it would just come into you. But that will only get you so far. That all that does is makes the learning curve a bit easier. Once, you, but if you go and put your notes to the paper and you kind of you work hard and you practice and you study and research it, you can get good at it. Way. It just all it does, it just means it takes more time. I mean, this, and especially with, with colouring in particular, there's so many online tools that can be a system that most professionals use. Like um, Adobe have a bit of software which just allows you to um, do colour wheels, which is learn what's all your contrasting colours, your complementary colours. And once you start doing, once you start do, doing these tools, you sort of, in the end, you pick it up like muscle memory. So you know what colours go with what, what tones go with what, and what will contrast, and you, you sort of learn what looks good to your eyes. And I think to be good at something, you have to know it's good. You have to develop that skill as well. Because that's always when someone's bad at something, they usually don't know they're bad. Mm -hmm. And it's the same skill. So you, research on books is great as well. Look at them, look find online colour palettes is a good trick. And you kind of look at it and you start learning, look at it and go, what does, why is that working? What's good about it? And once you in your brain know what's working and you start putting it towards like your own art, though that skill will just allow you to become better and actually it will allow you to improve quite quickly. Because uh, I, I didn't study art, but when I do something in pencil or ink, I just get a feeling yeah. whether something is good or not or whether something is missing and I should add it. But with color, I just look at it like that and I have no idea what color to add. I think every artist has a chink in their armor. There's a weakness, but the difference with some artists is some artists will find something they're not good at and will avoid it like plague. Mm. And they will focus on what they're good at. I always think if you find something you're bad at, that's what you need to focus on. 
because that makes you a great around you like if you put if you keep working on the thing you really hate like drawing or with colouring like the thing you really hate doing eventually you improve it and eventually you, you find there's nothing really I'm not good at <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we, we did a series of interviews with comic creators a while back, and we did one with Todd McFarlane. And Todd McFarlane was very much like, like he couldn't draw hands, so he filled volumes with hands until he felt confident with them. You know, he just wouldn't let it draw. He was like a dog with a bone. Until I, I master this, I'm, just, I'm not moving on, really. So, and you, you do, you have to address any kind of weak points, not run from them, like, as Liam was saying. You do need to focus down on that, and you know, otherwise you'll never really improve. You'll yeah. always be that level. Yeah, you, you always see there's some artists, a lot of artists hate drawing feet, and you'll see a lot of them, if they've got a cover or something, they'll draw a bit of smoke over the feet all the time, or everything's shot from the knees upwards. And, and that's just, and you look at it, and after a while you kind of learn, that's an artist who's got a weakness that won't confront you. And, it's, and once you know what you're looking for, it's really telling. So if you just keep at it and you kind of you know, look research all the tools, because there's so much free stuff available to help you learn. And just tap it and every time you tap it you go, I hate this, I hate this. All you do is go, I'll just do it again then. And you keep going, like it's like the dog with a bone. And eventually you, you will like this, you have no choice but to improve, right? And you put that much work and you just will improve. Okay. I remember when I got my the very first um I did a future shot for 2000 AD, which I penciled in ink. And the very first page, I had to draw uh, all the things I hate. So it was um, basically crowd scenes, horses, loads of hands. Um, so especially in comics as well, because you always get asked to draw all the different things. Um, yeah, and um, so what I, when people sort of ask me, and they say, you know, I'm not really, you know, a lot of people struggle with hands, or, you know, some people might, uh, struggle with certain poses. All I always say is, I always say to them, draw the things that are really difficult to you. And just keep drawing them over and over again, like to my farm, you know. And I, I still do, you know, I still go live drawing as much as I can. And, uh, you know, if, if there's, you know, I've got loads of sketchbooks at home, with just, um, just hands, in, where I've just drawn hands all the time, you know. And, you know, my hands have got better. Draw, drawing hands has got better for me, but obviously, I, you know, I think it's good that as an artist, you, 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 you know, you never get to the point you want to get to. And you just, you, as long as you're improving and you can see an improvement, I think that's, that's the main thing. You know, you will improve. People say, oh, you know, um, when I look at my drawings, they don't seem to be getting any better. But if you was to draw, say, a, a, you know, a pose of Spider-Man and draw the same pose a month later, you will see an improvement. It might not be a lot, it might be a big improvement, but you will get better if you keep doing it. You know, it's like, it, every pet just, you just keep putting in the hours. I think no artist is ever perfect, they've never reached a, you know, they're the perfect artist yet. Yeah. All that happened is they've got complacent. So when you see an artist who doesn't really improve, what that means is they kind of, they, they're good enough that they don't really question it. And they lose that desire to push it through. But the ones who really become iconic, every artist in history is the one who gets good, but still pushes, so still has that same drive like 50 and they did at 18 and keeps going at it. I mean, you know, when I was an editor and I used to do portfolio reviews, the first thing I could spot from a mile away were the people who just drawn from other comics. They'd read comics and everything was coming out of another comic. You know, and like, you, like everyone was saying here, they were avoiding certain things. But you, could, you, know, but you really have to be able to draw anything in comics. You know, you, you will be asked to, get, to, to draw a horse or a, I don't know, a jeep or a something, and you've really got to be able to draw a jeep and then skinny it down into a comic version of that thing. And you know, like an artist like, say, Frank Miller, didn't start off drawing in this stylized noir way. Yeah, you know, that, that came with confidence. That became, once he'd mastered the basics, once he knew how to draw a figure, once he knew how to draw a comic page, how to compose a comic page, then he was able to kind of throw a lot of the rules away and impose a, a real style on that. But he didn't start drawing that way. You know, you look at early Frank Miller, it's very much like a lot of the Marvel artists coming in. You know, so, you know, it's, it's, it's always this curve. I think people want to be able to leap in and draw like a McFarlane or a Miller or a somebody, but that's not the way it works. You know, you've got to put in the hard graft 
and then you develop your style on top of that. I, I was going to say, like, um, sort of Eric stuff as well, when you see Eric Toss stuff, and, and like, even like, even Anne, like Anne Davis, when you see his stuff, you know, his faces look quite simple, it's just like a, a shadow to the right, you know, just a fantastic way he does it, but it's all, all the previous work before that. He's got this really simplified style. It doesn't really look like he's he's doing much, but it's the novel. You know, he can edit edit all that sort of stuff. And you know, comics is kind of the art in the writing and the artwork of what to leave out. You know, comics can't show everything, and you can't style-wise have everything in there. So you've just got to shorthand all the time. Script, you're shorthanding. You're missing stuff out. You can't do every little movement. So you jump. You move scene, you you know, it's all a matter of sleight of hand in slightly comics. I also think that, especially with colouring, if you really want a challenge and you really want to push yourself, come to a convention, buy yourself an artist alley table, sit there and let people come to you, never met, come to you and go, I want to draw something. And like look, I used to hate drawing Dark Vader. Like I, I hate drawing it. But so many people over the years have asked me to draw it, but I got good at it over time because, it, and the convention had this extra bit of pressure where you don't have the luxury of the time to doubt yourself. Like you kind of, you, you basically go turn up to a convention with a bag of markers, kind of markers, and someone who draws them, you get them out and you basically have to go by instinct. And you basically, like, you never, there's no such thing as failure. All there is is doing it good or learning. And as long as you're learning, you can be progressive time, but when people come and just they're throwing most random stuff at you, and you have a split second to just kind of work out, oh, uh, you know, you're panicking the whole time, but you eventually get good at it because it's, it's just forcing you to just want to trust yourself as an artist. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Conventions are so good, you know, for, for, for artists, and for, for artists really, because you just get channeled in the time and stuff, yeah. stuff that you would never draw. You know, the fact that you're drawing most of the time is really so, um, Liam said that the uh, character he hated drawing was Darth Vader. So, a character you all hated drawing, and a character you all love drawing. Um, to this day, I still hate drawing the movie Transformers. <laughs> they're, they're literally, you might as well just get, close your eyes, get a pen, and just squiggle on the page, and you probably made one of them, right? They're just, they're so complicated here, they take so long drawing it. With robots, it's all about perspective, and it's, it's so much of the bits. And, and in convention, you don't want to spend like five hours drawing one head. You kind of, you've got to work time, so you've got to learn. But I mean, that way it's also good, because it teaches you about negative space, and characters like that. With the, more, the more minimalistic you go with art, the, um, the more every stroke of the brush counts, and the more you basically have to define shape Instead of defining it with like all these cross hatches in line, you go boom, boom, and, that, and that's, you know, that's a chip. And you, and you kind of really have to trust yourself. And it's a it takes confidence with that. For me, movie Transformers, hey, characters I love drawing, Harley Quinn. Harley Quinn. I, I've drawn her so many times over the years that it's, it's like I, I can probably do it while sleeping. It's muscle memory at this point. <laughs> right, so what about you? Um, well, funny enough, Transformers are quite difficult to draw for me. Um, I actually, everyone hates to draw them. I actually did work on Transformers a couple of times, but um, I got asked to do a sketch cover here with two characters, two of the Transformers characters fighting. Okay. But it, it's always been, it's always been, um, yeah, a tricky one for me. It's always been like, um, quite, you know, quite a, one that I don't enjoy so much. But um, I'm trying to think what else I, other characters I really hate. Um, I think that's probably about it, really. I can't really think of any more that I've. Um, the one that I love, obviously, uh, probably, probably Batman, I love, probably love drawing the most. Um, and Harley Quinn as well, so Scarlet Witch is another one I know. I know one thing I hear from a lot of artists who they always hate doing, especially at conventions, is caricatures. When someone goes, draw me as Batman or Superman, because caricatures, you can get wrong so easily. It's so easy to kind of put the wrong stroke of a line and suddenly the four-year-old drawing is falling. And kind of, you know, or you, you've accidentally you know, added 20 pounds to someone and kind of insulted them by accident. So, I think mean, a lot of artists I know actually, re actually refuse to do caricatures at conventions because they're so nerve wracking to do. It's, it's like certain people can just sort of 
do it more now, obviously more naturally than others, but it's, um, I always find it, I think I've got a rough idea to why you're doing it now, but I've always found it seems quite daunting, especially at the early conventions, people come up and say, oh, can you draw me? And it's like, okay, and it's like you are always kind of, it takes me a while to do it, you know, I can't yeah. do it. It's not, to me, it don't come naturally, but um, yeah. certain people it does, you know, so. Yeah. I mean, as a writer, obviously, I don't really have that problem, but um, I do know when I work with an artist a lot, what they, you know, you start to get a feel for what, you know, what their strengths are, what they like drawing. And with Jeff Senior, who I've worked with for, you know, over 30 years now on a lot of projects, I know Jeff inside and out in terms of the things he loves and the things he doesn't. So I just tailor my scripts now for him. And with To The Death, our creator-owned project, I wrote the whole thing as, as a very loose screenplay with minimal direction, some dialogue, but just more or less just a sense of the, the, the way the story's going and just let him draw it as he wanted to. And, you know, he hates drawing talking heads, so it's like just everything's on the move constantly in it. You know, nobody is static in this whole series. And, you know, you just so, as a writer, you do learn to play to artist strengths as well. Okay, so, so okay. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, what did you do for a living before you get into uh, the comic in the industry? I got in the comics industry straight out of university, so yeah. it was my first job. <laughs> um, yeah, mine's, mine's the same. I've always, I've, I've been very lucky. But I've always done art as a career. Um, I did animation before comics, and I, I started off in graphic design. But I'm, you know, I always knew from well from when I was pretty young that it's all I ever wanted to do really. So I just, um, yeah, I mean, from when I was about five, I just was drawing all the time. So pretty much the same now. So it's pretty easy. I mean, I was, as a kid, I was always a voracious reader and writer, so I just knew I wanted to write, but I just thought the only job that entailed was a journalist, so I trained to be a journalist, but thankfully I trained to be a journalist in a big magazine company that did comics, and so it was a very short step from realising I wasn't cut out to be a journalist to thinking, wow, this is a job, you know, I want this for the rest of my career, and, you know, so far, so good. And if you go to find a job in a company, does it matter from which university you graduate or...? Um, I think in comics, the same as any art job, I think the um, university you went to, same as your degree really, is less important than the work you produce in itself. Your portfolio speaks for you, but right? the university is just basically where you spend three to four years, like most people get drunk. But, um, <laughs> You're, when, you, when you show your portfolio, that's you, that's your ability. And if you're good enough, it speaks for them, they'll hire you based on, I know why I love art of career. It doesn't matter, like, it's, there's no politics really, you know, you went to this school, you get yeah. you in. It's, are you good, yes or no? Or are you what we're looking for right now, yes or no? And as long as it's yes, you get a job, really. I mean, in some ways, you know, university and graphic design, and they can hone a talent, but, if, if it's not there, it's not there, and you know somebody will see that. You know, a commissioning editor, especially with comics work, will see whether pretty quickly whether you've got that kind of. Even if it's raw talent, they'll be able to sniff it out pretty quickly. And you know, I I got to the point where I could look at a portfolio very quickly and just think, you're not getting the comic page, or you're just drawing pinups, which you know doesn't show me that you understand how to, you know, because a comic page is sometimes packed with small detail and, and has to flow in a way that doesn't break, you know, you should never with a comics page have to second guess where your eye goes next. And you know, that talent is something you, you just sort of either seem to have by osmosis or, you know, you don't, you know, maybe you could pick up a book and read it, but you just have to have that way of, of understanding the visual flow of a page as well, and I used to be able to spot that straight away if people couldn't. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions?
Oh. <laughs> oh, it's okay. So, what is it like working in the gaming industry or the animation industry? I, I just have to ask that. Um, video games is a weird one. It's it's a cross like between the um, very kind of I guess the sort of outlaw status of being a comic book artist, where you kind of work from home or you work in a studio collective and a normal office. Um, depending on the size of the game, like on the, on the rivers and kind of on these, like fan, you get these fantastic perks and all these treats. I mean, I've, I've done, I've, unfortunately I've done both. I've done the indie games where you are literally like eight people in a room and it, it's fun, it's, there's an energy to it, but it is very much you, uh, living off the seat of your pants. And when I was at PlayStation, it's it's sort of like a movie. Like you go in and uh, you, you know it's, you go into the the office and there's an ice cream machine in the office, sort of thing. And it's just you know that you get taken like you'll get told, oh, we're going to the Harry Potter tour, and yeah, it just weird things happen. But it's it's fun. It's compared to comics, the game industry is I find actually a lot more relaxing because the deadlines are longer. When comics you get in grain, you've got to hit like a certain amount of work per day, and in games, they expect it to a more polished degree, but they also will go, you have a month to do one image. Mm. And the, when I first joined the games, you know, I was like, is, is this a typo? Like a month to do an image? I'm like, you know, I'm going to be at the pub for most of this. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's just fun. <laughs> Anyone else I can say it. I mean, you know, it's funny with comics, you know, it, for us first, it tends to be a fairly lonely job. You know, we, mm. we tend to sit in our caves and we might communicate a little bit with artists and editors or writers, but largely you're, it's you. And often, you know, you have a great amount of control about the finished product. You know, my experience in both TV animation and games is that it becomes much more collaborative. You're involved with a lot more people. You have to bury your own ego a little bit because, you know, it, it's much more about lots of people having an opinion and this thing evolving as you go along. So, you know, animation is more collaborative. Games is even more collaborative. You, and I, work, I do a lot of my work for the games I work on, on on Google Spreadsheets, you know, which are being edited at the same time by other people. Yeah. You know, and you're live almost. You're putting dialogue in, and somebody is is live tweaking it as you're going along. So it's yeah. it's a weird way of working, but actually, I, I really quite like yeah. it. Yeah. I think with games as well, one of the best things I got told was you have to learn to not be precious about your work. Whereas comics, you'll put all this effort to ever make every line count, and you'll fight for that. In games, you get very much used to you'll do maybe two weeks worth of work, and suddenly there's a direction change in the game. And those two weeks worth of work you've done go straight in the bin, pretty much. And in the, you don't research, you don't touch it again, you don't look at it again. And you really have to learn to kind of, you create it, but you have to learn to let go of it. You, you, you can't fight all these battles all the time and go, like, you might go, but this character design's awesome, this has to be in the game. And eventually someone, like, in a suit and a tie on the board will go, no. And, you, like, there's no fight in it. You, you, so you have to really get used to that. It's, a, it's, it's like working in... Marvel DC, we work in, you're working on someone else's property, and just with games, you just have less of a say, really. Yeah. It's good, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, Any other questions before we wrap up? Yeah. Well, look, thank you very much for coming along and listening to us. It's been great seeing you, and, and we hope you've uh, learned a bit about breaking into comics. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.